So we're going to be in Hebrews 8 this morning, and I'm going to start by reading the entirety of the chapter. Uh, So this is what the author tells us, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. He says, now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to wreck the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that it was shown to you on the mountain." But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than that of the old covenant, as he's a mediator of of a better covenant, I apologize, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need or occasion for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, behold, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and in the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they shall, they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So as we move through Hebrews, we need to keep something in mind, especially as we enter into chapter 8. There's a a particular context that follows through, and I'm going to let you know now, I am very much nutshelling that context. Uh, By no means would I even have time to elaborate all of it, but very simply, it's this. The the readers or the recipients of of the letter of Hebrews are a group of Hebrew people who under crazy amounts of persecution in the first century are beginning to want to return to the old covenant, right? They, they, have, they have repented from their sins and their self-righteousness to hold on to Christ for salvation, and now they're contemplating the return back to the old. However, the author wants to let them know how nonsensical this is, and the reason is, is because what the old covenant was intended to do was point us to the new. Right? And so it doesn't make sense to return back to something that has been forward looking the entire time. And so it is a very silly thing for them to want to return back to what's old when the old has only been telling us of what God was going to do in the new covenant. Now, in chapter 7, verse 22, is actually the first mention of covenant in the book of Hebrews. Uh, And he's setting the tone as he moves us in toward chapter 8, and in chapter 8 what he does is he actually begins to tell us about this new covenant. In other words, things that we have in it, right? Uh, And so when we looked at chapter 7, Pastor Adam brought us through telling us about uh, Melchizedek and how Melchizedek, uh, though he's a very odd and mysterious figure with a lot of different ideas as to who he is and what he did, uh, we only really have two mentions of him in the Old Testament. Uh, And so what we see, though, is there's these certain things about Melchizedek that we read in the scriptures that are intended to be a foreshadow to tell us about Christ, 
and the, the covenant uh, that he would, he would inaugurate in his eternal priesthood, right? And so uh, you get into verse 5 of chapter 8, and I'm just bringing us up to, to the new covenant right here. When you, when you read uh, verse 5 in chapter 8, uh, he, he essentially tells us that when we look at these earthly things that have been established in the old, all of this was just a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, right? And so we don't wanna, we don't wanna stay on the earthly things, we wanna move toward the heavenly things. And so in verse six, he explains to us that what Christ has done is he's inaugurated something better. Something that God, this isn't new, it is new in a sense, but God has been proclaiming it from the beginning. Right? It's not like God suddenly changed his mind and said, I think we're going to try a new covenant, guys. Uh, this has been his plan, but Christ has inaugurated this new covenant. And so in verse 6, he says essentially that Christ has a superior ministry, and in that ministry, a better covenant, and that better covenant is fixated or enacted on better promises. And then he mentions a fault with the old covenant, that let me be clear, that fault is not the old covenant itself, but the people who are under it, right? And so as we move through this, I wanna look at uh, three things that we have in the new covenant that the author tells us very clearly. Now, if you don't know this, um, the author of Hebrews is, I, I may call him Paul every now and then because I am who I am, uh, but, uh, he's going he's gonna to quote from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, where God prophesies of a new covenant to come for his people. And so uh, what he first tells us is the very first thing we see that we have in this new covenant is a new heart, right? It's what Jesus talked about in, uh, in, in John chapter 3, this new birth. And so the first thing we have is we have a new heart. Now, this is superior to what we have in the old covenant, and the reason being is because in the Old Covenant, the best you could do is attempt conformity to rules, right? You would essentially try to adjust your behavior to fit what God's commandments are. And there might be some of you in this room this morning that when you think about Christianity, when you hear about Christianity, predominantly what you think about is I just have to stop doing the sin that I love to do good things that I really don't love that much in order so I can go to heaven in the end. And what we like to call that is fake it till you make it, right? And there may be some of you in this room that you think that's what this is about. And you're, you're missing the supernatural content that's behind the Christian faith because what we're told is that what God does is he gives us, in the new covenant, he doesn't give us rules to conform to, but he gives us a new heart by which he transforms us from the inside out. Right? This is God's work in our lives that he gives us a new heart and he changes us from the inside out. He makes us into a new creation. Uh, and this is essential. Let me just say that. This is essential. You've got to understand, you know, when you take the whole law and sum it up in, in two commandments, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's a big problem. Conforming to patterns of rules is not loving something. But let me ask you, how many of you in this room can make yourself love something by, that by nature you hate? You don't have that ability, neither do I. Right, and what we read in the scriptures, you go to Romans 8, 7, and some of this might be offensive, but it's the truth. You go to Romans 8, 7, Paul says, for the mind that is set on the flesh, that is the sinful nature, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Right? Not just that it doesn't, but that sinful nature that we're born inherent with, it can't submit to God's laws. It wants to be its own God because that's what Satan offered in the beginning. Eat from the tree and you don't have to have God as your God. You can be like God and you can choose for yourself what right or wrong is. It's the same deception that leads on through us today and so we, by nature, we have this hostility toward God by which we cannot submit to his law. And when his law comes along and says, do this, we go, no, I don't want to. You who are parents, you get it, right? You get it, because you've dealt with it. But all of us are that before God in our sinful nature. 
Ephesians chapter two, verses one through three, the apostle Paul says this. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Right, so if this is our natural condition, we need more than a new philosophy to come along by which we go, oh, let me follow along with this one. We need more than a list of rules that comes along and says this is how you need to live your life. We need something supernatural that brings us to life. And that's what the new covenant does. Because in it, it says God writes his law on our hearts. Now that, some of you guys, you're like, you, when you think of heart, you think of emotions. That's not what the heart is in the ancient world. The heart is the seat from which everything about your person springs forth. That's why in Matthew 15, Jesus says, from the heart come evil thoughts, right? Before anything enters your mind, it's already in your heart. It's what we would call today in modern psychology, the subconscious. It's that thing that we don't know what it is, but for some reason it gives us dreams when we're asleep and produces things in, in, vast, in, in heated moments that we don't know how to, and we're like, well, I guess that's what's shoved down in there. But the scriptures say that God puts his law on our hearts, the deepest part of who we are. And what that does, when he writes it on our hearts, it changes our thoughts, it changes our affections, and it changes our will. A similar prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, uh, it kind of parallels, kind of synonymous with what Jeremiah says. But Ezekiel says this, he says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I'll remove your heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my, listen to what God says, I'll put my spirit within you. And do what, Lord? Cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully obey my rules. That's what the Lord does. That's what we have the new covenant, is a new heart, a new birth, a new person. He says, and Paul says in Romans 6, 4, he says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's, you understand, as Baptists, that's why we baptize the way that we do. When Megan was baptized earlier, that's what this is all about. She placed her faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, and we believe that in some mysterious way, she was united with him in his death, and her old nature died, and she was brought to new life in him. And so we just celebrated this new covenant this morning. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And lastly, Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is so much superior to the old covenant because we have a new heart, a new person that delights, that delights in the things that God delights in. Praise God for that. Along with that, we also have the knowledge of God, second point. So in verse 10, we have the new heart. In verse 11, we have the knowledge of God. Now, uh, oddly, I had an assumption as to what, in the, I don't know if you know this, uh, probably don't care, but in the Greek, there's several words for the word no, right? And I had an assumption as to what I thought it was, but then I decided to get past my arrogance and actually look into it, and it was a word I didn't expect. It's actually a Greek word that mostly means to behold or to gaze upon, it's the word edu. And as I thought about it, I was like, why in the world would edu be the word used to know God? Uh, and it dawned on as I kept searching through this, this is what it means. It means an intuitive insight that is drilled into one's heart. So how much sense does that make when we say that in the new covenant, God writes his law on our hearts and on our minds, and he gives us the knowledge of him, which is this intuitive insight by which he drills it into our heart that in the deepest parts of our being, we become acquainted with our God. We come to know him, we're united with him. But well, we have to understand something. This does insinuate something. There was a point where we did not know him, right? There's a point where we did not know him. 
it's, a, it's a common theme in today's culture to believe that everyone is a child of God. Uh, we need to be very clear on what the scriptures teach. We are all children of God in that he created us in his image and likeness, but we are not all children of God as though we are adopted in his family. John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus speaks to a whole crowd of Jews, and he says this. He says, you are children of your father, the devil. Why? Well, because you're following after his footsteps. We just read from Ephesians chapter 2 where, where Paul says that because we're following the prince of the power of the air, the course of this world, and we're fulfilling the desires and passions of our flesh, he says we were all children of wrath. Then lastly, Romans chapter 10, verse 2, Paul says, this is, this is wild. Paul says there's a way that you can have a zeal for what you think is God, but it's not really God at all. He says, in, in, he, says, he says, I testify on their behalf. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So we can have a passion for what we think is God, and it was never God in the first place, because we never really knew him. So we need to be very cautious when we talk about the knowledge of God. This is something that God gives to us, right? Notice that it's him who initiates with us. And this is the pattern that you have from the entire Bible, right? From the moment Adam sinned, what happens? God comes in the garden and says, hey, where are you at? Let's talk. All the way throughout the scriptures, the whole history of the scriptures is God pursuing people to the point where he finally comes in Christ and lays down his life for his bride. God begins this work, but let me be clear, that is not an excuse to go, well, he's just beginning, he begins it and he does it, so I don't do anything. Because we need to remember chapter 5, verse 11, when he warns us against laziness or complacency in our faith. We are called to be co-laborers with the Spirit of God in us. Right? Don't miss that. What this knowledge of God should do, it should inspire an awe and a hunger to come to know him more. It should inspire an awe and a hunger. So if you have a, a knowledge of God that is not producing that, you might have a knowledge of God in ignorance. And I love you enough to tell you that. Because when we come to know him in acquaintance, it produces a desire to know more the infinitely glorious one. So we have a new heart, we have the knowledge of God, and then lastly, and how beautiful, verse 12, we have the forgiveness of sins. We have the forgiveness of sins. And let me be very, I want to talk about this for a minute. We're going to sit on this one, okay? Let me tell you what this isn't, because I think we have a lot of misconceptions as to what the forgiveness of sins is. Uh, number one, some of us think that when we talk about the forgiveness of sins, that that just means God is like our benevolent grandma up in heaven, and he just kind of enables and winks at all our bad doings and acts like they didn't happen, Right? And a lot of you who are parents, and I don't, I'm not trying to throw stones here, but uh, you want to think the best for your kids, right? I work in student ministry. I work with a lot of your students, and here's what I know. You will get very uh, defensive very quickly when someone starts to say anything negative about your child. You want to believe the best. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me just say this really quick. God, when we talk about God's forgiveness, this is not God just sweeping your sins under the rug and going, well, I just love you, so I'm just going to let them go. That's not how it works. Let me tell you how it also doesn't work. The forgiveness of sins is not applied to those who do enough good to outweigh their bad. Doesn't work like that, right? This isn't the scales of justice. Some of us, we say things like we're saved by grace through faith alone, and then we go, yeah, but after everything we can do. In other words, if I just try my hardest to be a good person, God will meet me in the rest with grace and, and, and mercy. That's not how it works. You were dead in sin. Right? And let's just, let's do this. If we have the scales of justice out and you have all your bad stuff over here and your good stuff over here, let's remember what Isaiah 64, 6 says, that all your good deeds are filthy rags. Let's put them right back over in the bad. Let me be very clear with you. You have absolutely nothing that you could do to outweigh your bad. There is nothing. And so God's not winking at your sin and letting it go. God's not going, hey, just try harder to be a better person and then we'll see what happens in the end and hopefully you can just outweigh all that bad stuff and, and be deemed a good person. And let me tell you why this is important. Because if you believe that way, you're actually degrading the character of God. 
You're degrading the holiness, the superlative holiness of God, that he is holy, holier, holiest, beyond comprehension. You're degrading his justice to make him much like a human. You're degrading his righteousness as though he's really not that pure and perfect. Psalm chapter 50, verse 21, he says, you thought that I was one like yourself, right? That's your mistake. When Martin Luther, during the Protestant Reformation, when he writes to Erasmus, he says, your thoughts of God are far too human. Let me me be very clear. He is infinitely beyond anything we can comprehend in his perfection, righteousness, and holiness. That's what it means to be holy. And he's not just holy, he's holy, holy, holy. So we don't degrade his character, but, but keep in mind, guys, God is just. He is just. What does that mean? Well, let's get a biblical definition. Proverbs seventeen fifteen: He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now that's problematic when we start talking about a God who is going to forgive sinners, right? How can God be just and declare wicked people innocent without becoming an abomination to himself. This is very problematic. And so God cannot just forgive and sweep away our sins like they never even happened. And I love what Adam, Pastor Adam said last week, uh, he kind of alluded to this, uh, but, but what is God, and, and bear with me, some of you might get offended by this statement, but hear the rest of the sermon, right? What does God require in order for us to get into heaven? He requires absolute perfection without missing the mark to even the slightest degree. Perfect obedience to the law without one sin at all. That's what justice demands. It's what justice demands. And let me be clear, that puts all of us in a really troublesome spot, doesn't it? Because not one of us has done that, nor can we. There's a debt that has been accrued due to our sin. And if God is just, and listen, it's not a rule of justice by which God's like, I gotta obey this. The scriptures say justice is the foundation of his throne. In other words, this is who he is and he cannot be who he is not. Some guys have said, well, God forgives you because he, in his love for you, he broke the law. False, absolutely not. God has never and will never degrade his own righteousness and justice and holiness, ever. So then the question we have to ask is how exactly then do do we get forgiveness of sins? And this is one of the things I think makes this new covenant so great, right? So when we look at the old covenant, we have some various parts to it. Well, number one, we have the law, right? We have the law in 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 the old covenant, which is the rules or the righteous standard that God has given us in order to be right with him. Now this is where the mistake comes in. We assume that what God is saying is if you keep these these rules right here, then we're good. And if you break them, then we're not, right? And so we try and use the law as a means of justifying ourselves or making ourselves right with God. And this is a vast mistake. This is not what the law was intended for. It's not what the law was intended for. What was the law intended for? Paul tells us very clearly, Romans chapter three, verses 19 and 20. Listen to what he says. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Listen to this. For by the works of the law, no human being. How many human beings? None. No human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In 2005, I was in a motorcycle accident uh, and my femur got pretty much dismantled and mangled in pieces and I got a helicopter ride down to Memorial Hermon 
uh, that cost $11,000, and then I got put in some, a bunch of machines and tanks where they did all these scans and different things, and they pull me out, and they put me in this room, and at one point, after several hours, the doctor comes in, he puts an x-ray up on the little board, he goes, all right, Mr. Roland, this is the condition your femur's in right here, uh, you can see all the pieces, he's like, we're, this is what we're going to have to do to fix it, we're going to do these surgeries for this thing, and this day, and this much, and, and so I'm sitting in the bed, now imagine for a second, doctor just gives me that, right, and I said, all right, doc. I hear you, but what if you just take me back in there and run me through that machine a few more times, right? And let's see if that x-ray machine will do something to kind of start to make my leg better. He'd be like, you are out of your mind, son. And do you understand, guys, the law functions as an x-ray machine for your soul to show you that you were sin sick and broken that you don't need rules, you don't need philosophy. What you need is you need a healer, you need a great physician. But there's a second part to this. We also had the sacrificial system in the Old Covenant, right? And in the sacrificial system, what we see is this constant reminder that innocent blood must be shed to pay the debt for our sin. And a lot of people get angry about that, right? You hear, you hear about that in the Old Covenant, they're like, man, they're just killing all these innocent animals for sinful people, that's so ridiculous. I'm like, I know, and that's the point. That's the point, right? If I have my own sin, then I cannot pay for my own sin, and I can't pay for your sin. And so something innocent that has never sinned has to lay down its life in order to pay for ours. That's how we make justice happen. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death. In other words, that which we earn through our sin is paid in death, an eternal one. But this is, where, this is where the gospel comes in so beautifully. Because what we're told about the gospel in this new covenant for the forgiveness of sins, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, being Jesus, who knew no sin. There's our innocent one. To become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God sent Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not, to live up to all the righteous requirements, right? Remember earlier I told you to get into heaven, you gotta be perfect, you can't have a flaw. But the problem is we have a ton of flaws. And so what Jesus did is he came as a representative. He lived the life that we could not, and then when he went to the cross, the scriptures say any man hanged on a tree is cursed by God. When he went to the cross, he bore our sins on himself. And in that, he bore the punishment of God for our sin. And so God's just wrath was poured out on Christ in our place. He is our substitutionary atonement. My friends, this is how we're forgiven. By the Son of God laying down his life. How much more beautiful than an unjust God in heaven sweeping sin under the rug. Paul explains this, Romans chapter three, verses 23 through 26. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means continually fall short of the glory of God and are justified, that is made right by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Propitiation means a satisfaction. That in Christ's blood, the justice of God is satisfied. Christ is the satisfaction for God's wrath toward our sin. And this is to be received by faith. Why did he do it? Well, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus. God keeps his justice and his righteous character by fulfilling justice on the head of Christ so that a group of wicked, condemned sinners could be forgiven. Justice is served, we just don't bear the penalty. 
On the cross, Christ bore the penalty for our sins. And so he tells us at the, at the end of chapter 8, he tells us that, that this old covenant is passing away, right? Why? Not, not because it's null and void and it doesn't matter. It's very relevant. It's very important. Listen, the resurrection and all the things we have in the new covenant would make no sense if we didn't have the old. Right? That's what foretells us of the, of the, of the new. But what we do see, Galatians 3.13, that Christ Jesus saved us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Hebrews 10, 14, which you'll get to in a few weeks, that by his one sacrifice, he is forever perfected. How long perfected? Forever. He's forever perfected those who are being made godly. And the author of Hebrews builds that verse off of this passage. We're forever perfected because God has forgiven our sins and will remember them no more because they've been handled on Christ. Who does that apply to? To those who are being made godly, those to whom God has written his law on their hearts and on their minds. So here's what we, here's what we have. Let me start to bring this home. Because we have this forgiveness in Christ, let me encourage you with something. Uh, we get to always, always, always move forward. Because the scriptures say that when we're not, if we're not saved, if we're not in Christ, we have one nature and it's sin and we're enslaved to it. But once we're in Christ, now we have two natures. Sin, desiring sin, and the spirit of God desiring righteousness. And these two things are at odds with one another. They're in battle. And so we fall, we trip, we stumble, we struggle, we wrestle. And let me encourage you. Where, where discouragement may come in and you begin to go, man, there's no way God can love me. Objective truth. God sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross 2,000 years ago because he loves you. And on that cross, Christ swallowed up your sins and your wrath so that you will never, ever, 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 ever have to face it. So you get to let go of the past and continually press forward. Listen to what Paul says, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. This is in the context of, of, of becoming perfect, right, sinless. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says there's a calling to holiness and sanctification. And I have this sin struggle along the way, but Christ has died for my sin. So no matter what, I'm not bound to my past. I'm not bound to my mistakes. I can continually move forward because the only sin we can let go of is a sin that's been forgiven, right? So we have the freedom to always be moving forward. But as we, as we go back through these points, we have to also look at the knowledge of God. I told you guys earlier what the knowledge of God should do in your life. It should be producing a desire to grow in and know more the glory. Imagine being in a marriage where your spouse doesn't want to know you any better. That's, that's miserable. Part of the beauty of marriage, I've been in it for a year, so I can tell you everything, right? Part of the beauty of marriage is getting to know more and more a person that you will never fully know. Here's what Peter says when it comes to the knowledge of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Why? So that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world as sinful desire. For this very reason. For what reason, Peter? For what reason? For the reason that we become partakers of the divine nature, that we have the promises of God purchased for us by the blood of Christ for the reason that we have everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of God. For this very reason, he says, verse five, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, and he goes on through this list. 
of attributes that we should be growing in and pressing for, right? I don't know where, I know we have a, a vast audience in here, right? And some of you are Calvinists and some of you are Arminian and some of you had no idea what I'm talking about. But here's what I can assure you. There's groups of people in this room that some of you may think that once we're saved, it's just God doing the work and I don't have to do anything, right? I just kind of glide through life and God does everything. That is not biblical. That is not biblical. We are called to be cooperating with God's work within I don't care where you stand on Calvinism or Arminianism. I'm just telling you now, if you think that I just stand here and God just does the work, you're not reading your scriptures. Listen to what he says in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved brothers, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why, Paul? Why would I do that? Because God is working in you to do what pleases him, right? So because, Paul says, because God is working in you, be cooperating with and working out what God is working in. We're called to walk with him in this. And let me close here uh, with, with um, I'm, I'm gonna call it an encouragement and also a warning. This is what can tend to happen. As we're looking at this new covenant, we have to remember that we're talking about our relationship with God. And here's what we might think sometimes. Well, my relationship with God was really good last week, but this week I've been stumbling and falling. I haven't read my Bible like I should. I haven't been praying. I forgot to, to witness to this guy at work, and, and I, I, you know, I haven't been loving. And so you're going, well, I feel like last week God and I were really good, but this week, man, I, I think he might be upset with me. I don't really know what to do. Let me tell you what you're doing right now. You have your entire faith and your relationship with God based on, on, on your performance, and while that might not be, you might not be using the Ten Commandments to do it, but you've come up with your own arbitrary system of rules that if I keep this, then God, God and I are cool, and if I don't keep it, then God's really mad at me. That's not the scriptures. Let me warn you really quickly what Paul says, Galatians 5 verse 4, to a group of people who were having this same struggle. He says, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. Listen to me. You are either completely and perfectly righteous with God because Christ has made you so, or you are not at all. But there is nowhere in the middle. And so you have to let go what Tim Keller says and mind my, I, I mean this with all reverence. You have to let go of your damnable good deeds, right? Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I have no righteousness of my own. Christ is my only righteousness. So Paul says in Philippians 3, I let go, I repent of any attempt to earn righteousness by the law so that I can be found having no righteousness of my own, but only that which comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Be very cautious that you begin to, to base your walk with God on how you're performing or how you're not. That's a very dangerous place to be. It is either all of grace or it is none of, but it is not both. So I'm gonna pray, the band's gonna lead us in worship and we're gonna respond to the message. Uh, however that needs to be, right? If you wanna sit in your seat and deal with the Lord because he's been talking to you this morning, or whether you wanna stand up and praise him because this new covenant is so amazing, or if this is the first time you're hearing this and you're like, man, I've had the wrong idea of what this faith is all about then we wanna pray with you. I'll be up here in the front, we'll have prayer partners around the room. Uh, we'll even have some up in the balcony, I believe. And if you have more questions beyond that, we'll, we'll be in the hospitality room, we'd love to talk with you. But we'll spend this time in a response. Uh, and so let me pray as we enter into that. Father, I thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to stand around your word, to, to proclaim your word, to proclaim your message. It's such a beautiful calling, Lord. But the news is almost too good to be true and your word tells us that to the world this message is foolishness, but it also tells us that the gospel is your power for salvation for all who believe. And so I'm praying, Lord, that if, if there's people in this room who have not known you yet, that they would encounter you now and they would come to know you. And if they do know you already, Lord, I pray that we would see your powerful work as you bring them from one degree of glory to the next.
But if I could ask for anything, Father, I would ask that Jesus Christ is magnified and praised for this new covenant that he has inaugurated for us to enter into relationship with you. He's worthy of all of our praise and all of our submission. So we ask that in his holy and precious name. Amen.